right. Bienvenido. All right. So uh, my name is Fabiola de la Cueva, like I was saying. Um, I used to work for NI. I worked for NI from 2000 to 2006. And then uh, I decided to leave to go get my master's in uh, electrical engineering, specializing in medical devices. I thought I was a hardware engineer. I was convinced I was a hardware engineer. And then people found out that I knew LabVIEW. And they started paying me to do LabVIEW programs. And I found two things. One was I pr was pretty good at it, and I liked it. So I went with my advisor and said, um, you know what, I'm going to finish the master's just because I like to finish what I started, and I really like the topic. Like, I, like biomedical engineering is my passion. But I think that my business is going to be developing applications in LabVIEW. And I've been doing that uh, since 2006, full time. I am a certified LabVIEW architect, a certified professional instructor, and a LabVIEW champion. And I was joking with people that I probably should start on testing because I'm, uh, I need kind of like to fill some of the void there. But anyway, the title of the presentation is a scalable plugin architecture for monitoring distributed real-time applications. It's a mouthful. I couldn't really advertise my presentation because I always forgot half of the title. But I think it pretty much describes what we're going to be talking about. All right, and we need to have the mouse there so the clicker works. There we go. And now I can get rid of the mouse. So why are you here? If you have multiple stations, and when I'm talking about stations, I'm talking about either test station, a test stand, a computer. You have multiple systems. And you know it's going to be from one to you have no idea. Like, you know your boss is going to come later or your customer is going to say, we know we're starting with one, but we can end with 10, 15, 20. We don't know how many we're going to have. This is a presentation for you. If you have deployed fully functional code that you don't want to modify, and this deployed code can be in real time or executables on desktops, and you want to be able to connect to them, I'm going to be giving you some tips for that. So this is a presentation for you. If your requirements will change over the life of the project, that never happens, right? Your users, your customers come and they know exactly what they want to see from the day they're talking to you. They tell you, yes, I would like to have this graph. And they have everything figured out. They never come back with the, wouldn't it be great if, like 10 months after the project started? That never happens, right? Well, so if your requirements change, especially your user interfaces, then this is a presentation for you. And uh, if you have multiple developers with different levels of proficiency and you want to give them an architecture that they can create modules on their own that would fit in your architecture without needing to understand how this architecture is implemented, then this is a presentation for you. So hopefully everyone in the room has at least one of this. And you're going to leave with at least one tip for each one of those points. OK? Hope you're excited. All right, I am going to be doing this as a case study. Um, one of my customers, Extreme Power, they're based in uh, South Austin, in um, South of Austin, in Kyle. They provide uh, cells. Actually, their product is this um, trailer here. What was the um, what was the button for the that that trailer? That's their product. What's in that trailer is uh, banks of batteries that they're going to be using to store power from windmill farms and um, PVC farms. They're not uh, necessarily, they don't do anything that has to do with this, with this. It's just the batteries. The way their system is implemented is fully implemented using PXI and single board reel. That's how they control when they're going to feed back the energy to the grid. Because you know, if you are acquiring uh, energy, if you're, if you're storing energy from the uh, windmills and you get a really rapid uh, increase in, in wind and you try to feed that to the grid, the grid doesn't know what to do with it. So what they're doing is they're smoothing out the energy so they can provide it back to the grid. Now this is a very specific application but we're still going to be able to show all the different things that I was talking about uh, on the first slide. The challenge that they came to me with was they needed a system um, that would let them monitor this trailer, oh, sorry, this wrong slide, um, that will let them monitor this trailer without interrupting the system, without requiring a LabVIEW license, 
and add new diagnostic tools without building a new executable. And another thing they wanted it was that they wanted it to look good. A lot of people tell me, you know, you cannot make tools in LabVIEW that don't look like LabVIEW. And they were, their team, one of the guys that was there when I uh, met them, was the guy that was in charge of doing their website. And he was the first one that said, you're not going to be able to make it look good. So I told him, OK, you give me all the GIFs, all the images that you use on your website. And I'll make it look the same as your website. And I was kind of curious. I mean, you guys do storage systems. Why are you so in emphasized on, I want it to look good? Well, when they deliver this big trailer, and they're doing commissioning, and they're doing all the measuring and everything, their customer walks by, just as any of us that are doing the smaller applications, and they're going to be watching over their shoulder, and the tool better look professional. So that's why it was imp important. The uh, not requiring a LabVIEW license, the main thing was they already had their license to develop the system. Once they deploy these trailers, they can be all over the world. Right? They don't want to have to send every engineer or every technician that goes to do commissioning or, or maintenance with a LabVIEW license just to connect 10 minutes to see how things are going and then leave. I'd rather stay for this, but I haven't. It's OK. It's OK. Uh, I won't be offended if you guys uh, step out. There are pretty cool uh, presentations going on the other rooms. <laughs> I wish I could clone myself and be on those as well. OK, so the solution that we came up with is we have an executable that's going to be running on the laptop that the engineer is going to be either bringing to the site or monitoring from their office here in Kyle. And then they're going to have, and I'm going to be calling them tools, configure, uh, these tools here, I'm going to be calling them diagnostics tools. They're basically VIs that are going to be loaded into this sub panel here, that we're going to see later. And they're added via configuration file. So basically, the developers go and create a new fantastic tool. They don't have to create a new executable. They just add that new fantastic tool to a configuration file, restart the system monitoring tool, and they have access to it. And we are going to be using BI server to communicate with our targets. In this case, it's the PXI systems and the single board reel. So just to reiterate, the user is going to launch the executable on the laptop. The executable uses a configuration file to populate this list here on the left. And then the tools, this is something that I want you guys to remember, because as we go on the presentation, you're going to forget. The tools are running on the laptop. At this point here, I have zero connection with the remote system. OK? Tools communicate with target via server. It's when the tool is running that I connect to VI server, and then I can connect to the remote target. OK? All right. So I am going to be presenting. There's different things, different ways you can communicate with the tools. But I'm going to be presenting three specific methods for communication. The first one is we're going to be using VI server to list all the VIs that are currently on, targets, on the target's memory. This is the one that if you guys already have executables, you already can do that one if you have uh, VI server enabled, which we're going to see later. But this is the one that requires the minimum amount of modification. The second one is uh, launching dormant VIs. And um, I struggle with a good name for these VIs, but I felt like this was the best one. They're VIs that are part of your executable, but they're not an integral part of your executable. Like your executable doesn't use them. So they're just there when you build executable just to provide a back door for you to get into the system. So you have them dormant while the system is running, and only run them when you're ready to do your monitoring. That way, if you have something that's kind of uh, getting some uh, extra resources or getting on the way of your actual system, it only gets on the way a little bit, and then you can tell it, OK, go back to sleep. All right? Um, I've heard other terms for this, but dormant was the one I picked. So it's not an NI term, it's just a FAFS term, OK? Um, and the third one is use FTP to replace configuration files at the NI real-time startup uh, folder. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you. I did this presentation at the LabVIEW Architects Forum here in Austin. And we started going, and also I did it for some friends, and we started going on and what other cool things we could do with this. 
Um, so I'm going to mention some of them, but I'll do it at the end. Uh, and the important thing here is the real-time application it still runs as usual. You don't have to stop the process of smoothing the energy and getting it back for the grid. Any questions so far? All right. So I'm going to do a demo. And because I was scared to that to uh, do it in, uh, in public, OK, I need to. It's, I did a video for you guys. So you'll see that on the top here, I was just showing that this computer is running on a different IP address than the IP address that's listed next to each one of these systems. At the bottom of the screen, I have just telling the user that I'm downloading all my tools from the diagnostics.ini file. So here, I'm going to be opening on the PXI system the PQ monitor. By the way, this screen here, it's a tab control. I think I achieved the look for the website, right? It's probably, it probably doesn't look graphic designer quality, but it does look like the website. It's not as good as LabVIEW. It's not a LabVIEW. It's not as good? It's not as good. OK. <laughs> I'll, I'll work on it, Dimitri. So um, I have different functions here. So it's a tab control. And it's running in a sub panel. And at this point, I am connected to the system. I am actually seeing real data on the system. Now, that was a little magic trick there. I undock the VI from the sub panel. And I'm going to go and look another similar system in a, not, in a different part of the world. And I want to see how the, both of them compare. So I undock it from the sub panel. And now I can see the, both of them together. On the top of the window, I have still the IP address and the name of the system. Um, also, I was very proud of this. Of course, I did this in 2009. And then 2011 came out with their checklist. And I was like, thank you very much. A couple of hours there wasted. But these were groups uh, by, by, by signal, so it's pretty cool. Um, if I want to bring it back from out space there into the sub, sub panel again, I just need to double click on the tool, and it brings it back. This way, I didn't have to give the docking on docking functionality to the tool. It's all kept on the system monitor. This one is my VI crawler. I love this one. This is the one that lists all the VIs in memory. Then if that VI happens to have a sub-VI, I can list the sub-VI. It's actually a global probe. It's giving me all the controls in each VI, what's their data type, and then what's their value. So this one, it's very useful for the engineers back in Kyle. Somebody's in commissioning. They're seeing something wrong. He can say, OK, go to the VI crawler. Look for this particular VI. The guy that's doing the commissioning might not know what the function is for that BI. But the guy back in Kyle who developed the system might want to know what value are you seeing in this particular terminal. Because that's going to give me information about it. OK? And then the third one, I'm still on teaching there. OK, there's the. And then finally, the third, the third tool. In this case, we're using generate PLC configuration file. The system also has a PLC. Uh, and what we're doing there is just selecting what path we're going to use. And then if I had all the information here, I would open the file. It would list the information that I want to send to the PLC. And look that I have these buttons grayed out. Because I could mess up with the system pretty quickly by just sending files to the FTP. All right, here is I'm just going to open all the tools that I just showed you, undock them from the sub panel. And then uh, we're going to exit the system, and we're going to see how all of the different tools receive the message to close at the same time. So I, I click on the exit, and everything closed. All right? So I wanted to show you the solution first. Not, not so much, well, I, I, I wanted to show off. But, um, <laughs> but I also wanted to show you the, the solution so it, you would, it would make sense what I'm going to talk next. Again. The, least, the key points is this list here, the tree control, is giving me all the systems in the network. They're located in different parts of the world, and they're listing different tools. Each diagnostic tool is an independent VI. Of course, these VIs, in order to be able to make them run on the sub panel and have multiple copies of them, I made them to be, well, what, how did I change their properties so I could have multiple copies? I made them re-entrant. OK? So all my tools here are re-entrant. So we already get the first rule of my tools. 
All right. These flows are just shows what you just saw. Again, you are going to be reading from a configuration file. The configuration file is going to have the name of the VIs that you want to put in your uh, list so the user can click on them. And then we wait. Of course, you know that this wait is really not waiting. It's the event structure. But it was the best way I could find to uh, represent it. And then if the user clicks on a current tool, there's nothing for me to do. If they decide that it's a different tool, then I need to check if they're going to a different target. The reason I'm doing this is because the system monitor is the one that's going to be opening the connections to the targets. If it is a different target, I disconnect from the current application. and I'm going to connect to the new application. And then on load and load panel. Now, this was the original flowchart. As soon as we added the magic of undocking and docking and having multiple stuff, these got a little bit more complicated. But uh, I decided it didn't make sense to uh, scare people with this. So I'm going to show you the key uh, code components for each thing. And of course, do not get scared. I don't expect you to read the whole thing. But it's there. So when you download the slides after the show, you can read a little bit more about what each function does. In this case, for reading the configuration file, we're using uh, more good ideas, read anything uh, VI. You can find it on the VI package manager. You just look for MGI. And it's a really cool uh, little tool. The other one that I have used in the past and I like also, so the difference is the uh, read anything is, is better for INI files, where the ECXML from JKI, it's better for XML. You create clusters. I love this. The point I want to make here is that we chose to do this, but it doesn't matter what tool you are comfortable with. What we want is you have a file that lists which items you want to load on disk. It's up to you to choose which one you want to, you want to do. Uh, then another place, uh, the tree control. I use the tree control library that uh, Norm Kirshner did, and it's available in the Lava G code repository. I did some modifications to it, and um, as soon as I have some time, I'll make them available for the community. But I'm still working on them. Um, and I use that for the tree control that lets you choose which tool you want to use. For the connecting to an application, I'm using our open application reference from BI server. Again, this is running on the system monitor. And then finally, uh, I open the VI reference and insert it in the sub panel. It's still running on my little desktop. I still don't know where these other VIs are going to be coming from. Questions? OK. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I tell my students. Either I'm a really great teacher, which I'm going to go with that one, or you guys are very smart. I think, well, no, 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 you guys are very smart, and you're getting it at all. It's OK, it's OK. So here's the list of the, uh, an example of the diagnostics file. So I have PXI system. I have the IP address. I have the port. The reason I need to have the IP, the IP address and the port is because now we're starting to worry about how is it that I'm going to get information from that target. All right? And that gets translated directly into the list that you saw on the left. Now, I was, uh, when I was showing this presentation to Norm, I was calling these the, the, the keys to the kingdom. You're going to be seeing this cluster throughout my presentation. It was a cluster that has um, a reference for the uh, application reference. So once I connect to the target uh, that I want to monitor, I open the application reference for the LabVIEW environment running on that target. So if I'm running a deployed executable, I am going to be connecting to the runtime engine. If I'm uh, uh, running a deployed target on uh, deployed code in real time, I will be connecting to the runtime in the real time environment. Then I have a little uh, user event here. That's what let us, at the end of the demo, close everything at the same time. And um, the tools are going to register for the st stop event. And here's a little uh, pet peeve of mine. I had to add this third one there because it turns out that there's not a property node on the application reference for you to tell me the IP address because you normally open when you're using these little guy over here. You normally open this and use the reference on the same place, on the same code. 
and here you already have the IP address. So I guess nobody had done this where I send it to another VI as a sub-VI. So I had to add this to the cluster. So if you think that that's silly, <laughs> there's, a, there's a little idea that I put in the idea exchange that has two votes, me and my best friend. So um, if you think that this is a good idea uh, or you start using this application, please vote for it. All right. So who knows who this guy is? Now, you, you're not allowed to say. Any takers? No? OK, Jack. Who is it? That's Norm Kirshner, known as the captain on the forums. Uh, he dressed on the, what was it, Halloween of 2009 at the, as the headless VI server. So the VI server has been available since LabVIEW 5. It lets you control LabVIEW objects and the environment, and it allows remote access using TCP IP. Nobody here is working on any, anything earlier than LabVIEW 5, right? OK. Everybody familiar with VI server? Yes? All right, so I'll skip that. Um, who's familiar with the multiple LabVIEW instances problem? No? OK. Or not, not the problem, but just the idea that you can have multiple instances running at the same time. Yeah. This is something that I thought, oh, no problem, just easy. Uh, I, had a, I, I went back after starting working on this project to my computer and went to the options menu on LabVIEW. Like you go to uh, tool options and then you go to VI server and you enable it and you give it a server and you think you're good. You will do executable and the executable doesn't work because there's two different places or three different places where you can enable the VI server. If you go to the options uh, that I just described, that enables VI server for the LabVIEW environment. But if you want to enable VI server for the computer, the code that's running on your project, you have to right click on their my, my project, on their my computer properties, and enable it there. And an easy way to realize that you're talking about two different instances is you go and enable it globally, and then you go to your target and try to put the exact same port, and it's going to tell you that's already taken. So it's not the same application. And again, this probably doesn't make sense now, but if, when you get to try it, if you get stuck, give me an email and I'll, and I'll help you out. Um, in our case, we're going to have the deployed executable that's running on the PXI, the deployed executable in the single board Rio, and the executable running on the system monitor on the desktop. All right, so for the communication options, again, I said I was going to talk about three different uh, methods of communication. For the first one, we're going to use VI server to get information from running VIs uh, on target. Then we're going to use my dormant VI inside the embedded code. And the ways that you can make sure the dormant VI makes it into your executable, it's that either you put it on the always included in the executable section of your build specification. You do a static reference to the dormant VI somewhere in your code, so that way it gets loaded. And then this one is something that I learned from Omar Musa JKI. He creates a VI that documents his application on the block diagram that has all the VIs that he uses, and it has like arrows saying how the communication works, and et cetera. And he includes that VI. The name of that VI could be VI always included. And that's the only thing he puts on the section on his build specification that's for the always included. He, you spend more time on your code than you spend on the build specification. It's a lot easier to remember to go drop a VI in the block diagram of that always included VI than it is to remember to go to the build specification and put it there. Okay, so I I I, fi I find that it's easier for me. It's I think it's a good tip. Uh, and then the third one we were going to use the FTP in our case to replace a configuration file. All right. So the first one is get information from the target. So our steps are going to be I'm going to get the keys to the kingdom. You remember those keys? Was the cluster that has the application reference? because the system monitor was the one that opened the application, and then the, uh, the event I want to register to. Then the step two is I'm going to get the information um, 
reference to the VI inside the target. Here is where I start getting the fun on communication with the target. And then finally, I'm going to probe controls and indicators. So there's, there, there's that. There's my little keys to the kingdom. I get my stop event and my application reference. Here is where I say, okay, I already opened the connection to the application reference. Now I say application reference on the PXI. Again, this VI is running on the system monitor. And I'm telling it, please, PXI, tell me how many VIs or what are the names of the VIs that you're exporting. I'm sorting them to, and then I'm putting them on this drop down box. By default, I open the first VI on my list here. And then I go to town and say, please give me the, um, get me the VI reference for that. And then I use these two methods, the uh, control value get and the control value get for controls and indicators. And I have a little token here that I developed that's going to change all that variant data into the stuff that you saw on the table. The section here on the right can be different things. What the thing you have already for free, if you're connecting to your deployed application, is that you can have the list of everything that's running on that VI. And that might be all you need on that executable. Any questions? Okay, good. All right, so the next one is the Dorman VI. Again, the Dorman VI is running on the system monitor. It's going to get the keys. Then we're going to be awakening the Dorman VI. And finally, we're going to be using this Dorman BI as the back door into the target. So we go first with the get keys. We have our little cluster there. And in this case, I knew exactly what uh, VI I want to connect to. This is a static reference to the VI that is inside the target. I am getting its name and using that to open it, and I, then I launch it dynamically. I just left here the user event just for you to remember that at some point in your code you need to register for this stop event. But what is important here is this guy. This is running inside the target. So if you see you have your application instance for the target, well you have your target. Inside your target you have your active real-time code running here. And somewhere in your target you had that dormant VI. The only thing, notice the icon is the same as the static reference there. So the only thing I said is, please run this VI that's called real read globals, that's going and getting information from the entire system. Do the function read, and then from then on, I'll do things with that data that I get from you. Now, this is very, very powerful, and the reason we call it the back door is because this VI could be launching other VIs. So I could be just run into connecting to it and say, okay, Dorman VI, please go and do some trash collection or go trash the system. No. That no. That's a, what was that? Did you trash the system? Did I what? Trash the system? No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I, I I didn't get that. But uh, when Jack was uh, helping me review my uh, my application, he had a good point. You have to make sure that you test these guys often. Because you can have these little Dorman VI that for me is a sleeping beauty could become into the giant dormant BI that comes and trash your system. So you do have to be very thorough to make sure that these BIs are tested. Because remember, they don't run on your executable. They're not used by your executable. And they provide a backdoor, backdoor into your system. So it's great power, but with power comes responsibility. So you know, make sure to be careful about this. Yeah. Also, yeah, also that's a good point that Jack had. When you fire them up, you could be affecting determinism on your real-time application. So, again, you have to be careful on what you do with these guys. So they're not compiled into the executable and not the target? They are compiled into the executable, but they're not used by the executable. They're used for... They're not called. They're not called, they're yeah. They're, they're in memory, but they're not running. They're there for you so you can go and get information from your system. Yes? In this particular case, it's just giving me data. It gives me the data, it goes back to sleep. So if you want to add dormant VIs to a target with an executable, can you do a plug-in? Or you have to replace the executable? Yes. 
it, you, the question was, can you add a plugin into the target that's a dormant VI? Yes, you can. One of the, this is one of the things that we started to discuss when I present this application at the Architects Forum. You would have to compile your VI and make sure that you include all the VI leave calls that it makes, right? And send it as a complete, like a source distribution, but make sure that all your VIs and the VIs that it's calling are compiled, and then you could provide them. And we could use, nice in entrance, we could use the FTP method in that case to send the compiled code to the, to the target. Yes? Uh, yes, yes, you do have, you do have, in order for the, and this would be for the, for this guy. In order for this to work, VI server has to be enabled. You need to know which port to connect to, and you need to have the, um, uh, the list of which VIs you want to export. All right. Not magic trick here. I'm just using the FTP VI. This is the method that made me change my setup cluster so I had to add the IP address because I couldn't get it from the application reference. If I had stayed with the others, stick to the other two methods, I wouldn't have needed it. So, all right. And then the other thing, before I move on, any questions up to here? All right. So the other thing that you saw, the docking and undocking, I got that code, uh, the idea, from when I teach the advanced architectures in Navio. There was code uh, um, donated by Arensen. I'm going to give the, the information at the end of the uh, code to do the undocking and docking. But I also realized that if I wanted to make sure how many tools I had open at a time, so I wouldn't get errors, because you know when you put something in the sub-panel, the front panel needs to be closed. It cannot be open. So if somebody, if the user had already undocked the application and they clicked again on it, the system would give an error because the front panel is already open. So I decided to use a little uh, variant as a dummy database to keep track of how many VIs I have open and, uh, and ha I have a way to access them and compare them when I have them undocked on the system. I use this is based on Darren's Nuggets uh, Variant Databases uh, entry. I created a little bit.ly for you if you want to go check it out. And also, if you can fly, um, travel in time, Altenbach, the, uh, Christian Altenbach did a really good presentation um, paralyzing the unparalyzable. And he actually went into more, much more detail on how to do the whole using the, the variant as, a, as, a, uh, as a, a dummy variant as a database. So you cannot travel in time, but the slides are going to be available after the uh, NI week. So when you go and download my slides, you can get a reference to what are the other slides that you need to download. And basically what's happening here is, OK, who has used here variants as, as a small databases? All right, so I'm not really showing you the. But basically what happens is a lot of people know about the variant, but they don't know about these little cool trick here that they have attributes. So you can list as many attributes, and they're really good for implementing lookup tables. They're fast, too. All right, was this system scalable? When I left this system running about a year ago, it was fully working with two targets, one SV Rio and one PXI system, and only four diagnostic tools. When I was preparing for this presentation, and I came back and put together a whole list of things, uh, you saw the list. They had tens of systems, and they were all running throughout the world, and they had tons of more tools. So, and they had never really had to call me with how do we do this. I showed them once, gave them the easy rules. Your VIs need to be re-entrant. Your VIs need to have a setup uh, cluster in your front panel somewhere, and it's a type F. And, um, and you just need to keep it straight on the side so it fits well on the sub panel. Other than that, that was pretty much it. And they were able to do it. So 
Oh, and also, they needed to make sure they added it to the INI file so the users could actually load it. So, okay, before I go on. So, I, I, I mean, it was really, I think this is one of the applications that I'm the proudest. I have worked in a lot of applications, but the fact that I could do what I love to do, which is go teach a group of developers how to do something, make it readable, maintainable, and sustainable so they don't have to call me again, I think it was, uh, we succeeded there. They, they did call me again for other projects. <laughs> OK. Could this be done using object-oriented programming? I really wanted to do it using object-oriented programming. But we started working in 2009. It was still considered fairly new to use native classes. So um, I made it my goal that I was going to do it for, for NI week, but we didn't have time. Uh, so I, I made a list of the things that I would do if I was to do the system using object-oriented programming. One thing is that setup key, the keys into the kingdom, I would have made that into a class. And one of the things that I tell my students when I teach is, well, you know, when you're, you're teaching core one, core two, you tell them, if you're going to be doing an enumerator or a cluster, the very first thing you have to do is make a type F, right? Once I start teaching object-oriented programming, I start telling people, whenever you have a cluster on your code, you should be asking yourself, should this be a class? And the setup, the setup cluster, as soon as I put it in, I knew it should be a class. When I had to add the IP address, I was convinced that it should have been a class. Because I had to go back to all the tools that had already been implemented and make sure that I didn't break them because I had to add this. Um, the other thing that the converting the setup into a class would have been better for is I could have put some rules for shutdown. I mean, in this case, uh, any of the launched BIs could, they have the registration there, they have the user event. So they could go and generate a stop and kill the other BIs. And that's okay, that might, might be something you want to do. But when you have a multiple team of developers, you have to start kind of protecting them from themselves. So uh, if you set the rules in, in place where the code would not let them do that, that would be better. If you want, uh, another thing I could have done is the, the state machine that I used to fire everything in the system monitoring could have been done with the command pattern. There's a really great example that uh, Eli Carey did. And, and the nice thing about that example is that he did it first with traditional LabVIEW. Then he did it with object-oriented programming using the command pattern. And now he has the same example using actor framework. So you can see the evolution from the three different uh, things. Um, Alan Smith here, he's sitting back there. He, uh, he actually was the original architect on this application that I did. So a lot of, I'm not going to take the, the whole credit. Um, he also helped uh, Stephen Mercer with the actor framework. Uh, come to fruition when he was, he started when he was an, um, a customer and now he works for an eye. And he said, you know, this really doesn't add anything to your presentation, but I think it does because it does bring another thing, another way you could do it. You could use the system monitor, could be an actor, and then each one of your diagnostic tools could be a div an, an actor on itself. So you could be firing your diagnostic tools as different uh, actors. The shipping example that comes with 2012 has uh, an example of how to load them on a sub-panel. So we could definitely do a combination between, between that example and what I show to create your actors. And another free advertisement. At lunchtime, right after this session, they're going to have the round table. So if you haven't had enough of about actor framework, you can go there. In half an hour, yeah. Um, and then uh, this one was something that I discovered yesterday. I was, uh, well, not discovered. I had talked to Stephen before. But one of the reasons my customer didn't want to use classes was because he had heard that classes did not work on uh, real-time targets, and especially that they would mess up with determinism and cause jitter. So yesterday, Stephen Mercer, on the state-of-the-art uh, presentation he did, he said it does work on real-time. And the way that, that the, the dynamic dispatch does not add, add any jitter. What would add jitter is if your calls, your different calls on that dynamic dispatch, are not the same duration. So we could have done this doing classes. Yes? Yeah. 
Yes. So to reiterate what uh, Alan is saying is there's nothing that's wrong or that would cause the jitter just because you're using classes. It's how you're using the classes that would introduce the jitter. And then uh, I'm a big person, a uh, big fan of resources. All my, uh, the people I have in on my, course, on my courses would tell you. I send them like these pages and pages of emails of things to go and learn more about. So I thought I would do the same for you. There's, uh, of course, there's the Lava G code repository. There's tons of goodies there. Uh, large apps, I already mentioned that. The advanced architectures on Navio course, especially if I teach it, um, it's pretty good. And that's where I got the code for the Eric Arendson code uh, to do the undocking and docking. There's the little Darren's nugget. And uh, if you wanted, another, uh, another thing that we explored was to use patch packet project libraries so we could compile the code and use it as a, as a source distribution for the plugins, both on the executable side for the system monitor and on the deployable target for the dormant VIs. And uh, eventually, that's my website, eventually you'll have some of this code there. So. I wanted to do a special thanks. Uh, these are the people that had to put up with me reviewing my presentation. So it would be in good condition and NIW quality for you guys. And also, I had to do the advertisement for the CLA Summit. So if you like NIW Week, and if you like Lavio, and you like Talking Shop, it's like that to the tent, I would say, during the CLA Summit. So if you don't have your CLA, go get it. This is the best reason to have a CLA, because we get together and have another excuse to meet more than once a year. Uh, it's going to be March 4 to 6 in Austin and April 6 to 8 in Paris. And uh, last year I was the chair for that, uh, and now this year is Rob uh, Homsfeld is going to be the chair. One thing about this event, it's totally driven by the community. And I get to present on the second day, but the first day is our day. So we get to talk about things that we find interesting or important. So if you want to learn more about that, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer any questions. So, questions? So uh, the question was if the tools are compatible on all the targets. No, uh, only, only this SV Rio has a list of tools and the PXI system has a, a list of tools. That's another thing that could be improved right now. It's left to the person who configures the configuration file to choose accordingly or correctly. We do have an error handler, so if you were trying to connect to a Dorman BI, for example, that's not there, the system monitor would not crash. It would just report that the VI is broken and cannot be loaded in the sub panel or the information. Yes. Yeah, it's on the configuration file. So the other, the other nice thing about the configuration file is that you can have configuration files for different uses, right? So you could have the configuration file for commissioning, the configuration file for troubleshooting, the configuration file for the manager. Managers just need to see little nice pictures and graphs, right? Any other questions? Okay. No, in this case, they, they already had everything they wanted. It was a pretty stable uh, executor. I don't think they're adding any Dorman BIs. They might now. I mean, I, like I said, I left it working with them. And at least on the list of tools that I saw when I was preparing for this presentation, there were not any added since the last time I had looked at the code. Did you give me a list of tools for those two? No, those are pretty open. Yeah, they, they, they go from the uh, pretty uh, nice, innocent, let me just read globals to some that do things that are a little bit more scary. And that's why uh, when Jack was talking about it, he was like, yeah, you know, you have a point. Some of the things they're doing, it probably would be wise to, to have some limits. Yeah? So is there any, are there any safeguards against uh, downloading into the target some untested or inappropriate content? Because it's kind of security breach. So their question is, are there any rules to you know, prevent you from downloading things that are going to trash your system? Um, there's not, the only thing, you show on, on the example I did with the FTP, I had, I don't know if anybody noticed, but I had the user and the password were blank. And that was on, for, for the purpose of this. In their system, they actually have it password protected. So you, not anybody just can go and download things. 
Uh, they also have other safeguards on the, on the way you connect. Like the way I connect to that system is I have to go through VPN, go through their firewall, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then connect to the target. So and some people were worried that I was giving away the IP addresses, so I had to gray them out, but they are, they are behind, like I have to go like three different steps before I can connect to it. And I, that's also why I recorded the demo, because I didn't want to have to deal with problems like that while we were here. So when we started, we thought we were only going to have like a handful of tools, right, Alan? So we put them in a, in a LV leave. So all the, uh, all the tools are in a, in, in a library. So they, if you bring one of the tools with you, it comes with all its family. So they, when the users are, the different developers are working on the new tool, they have to make it available via the project, the project library. So that means that they need to put it in the same place. Any other questions? How am I doing? Is that good? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you like it. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around.